So um, I work as a data curator um, in the eBrains creation team. And in this session, I will walk you through the different steps for publishing and also accessing research through eBrains. So I would like to make this session as interactive as possible. And um, so I'll be sharing a couple of questions and ask you to share your opinion on them throughout this talk with a number of polls. So you can vote via our computer if you have a computer at hand. So I'll post the, um, the link in the chat for the poll, or you can go to the website, um, pollev.com and then Michael von Suite 398, or scan the QR code. And uh, the polls, whenever I open them, they pop up and I would really like it if you vote. <laughs> and then we can discuss those a little bit. Uh, I've also included more QR codes on the slides uh, that directs you directly to the pages that I'm talking about. And you can discover those in parallel as well. Uh, again, I will also post them in the chat. And since a lot of you are on site, I have also decided to just show them on my screen to make it a bit easier. Okay. So as you probably already heard, the eBrace research infrastructure is a platform that addresses the needs and concerns of both neuroscience data providers and also data users. Uh, for example, data providers need a data repository for long-term storage of their data and a persistent identifier such as the DOI to make the data findable and also citable. Data users, on the other hand, need the possibility to find, access, and process shared data to validate and complement existing data to avoid also the duplication of research. And eBrains covers a wide variety of neuroscience data ranging from cellular levels to large scale networks, brain areas, species, and are linked to a number of research techniques. So within the eBrains, uh, we have a number of different services. The eBrains creation services support you when you want to share your data, software, or a model. We have the eBrains Knowledge Graph, which allows you to discover and access uh, research through eBrains. And we have the eBrains Atlas services, which provide an inter interactive atlas viewer for human, mouse, and rat brains. And most importantly, the Knowledge Graph and the interactive atlas viewer are tightly connected, as I will also explain later in this session. In this session, I'll mostly focus on the find and share services of eBrains, and that's why I divided my talk into two parts. So let's have a look at how you could publish your research through eBrains first. And also let's start with our first poll. So if you've been able to access this, this poll, then I would like you to fill in whether or not you've already shared uh, data or a model or any scripts anything that's research related with other people. So I'm releasing the, the app poll and then the results should come in. I'll, I'll leave it for a little while uh, to see if to let people more vote. Okay. Maybe it's stabilized now. <laughs> Maybe people have not been able to vote. Um, oh, more changes. I think this is great. It's a great start. Uh, I think it's nice to, uh, to see that quite a few people have already shared their data or they're willing to share their data. And I think this is exactly <laughs> what I like to hear and what my, my talk is for. And hopefully the people who have not shared, I can help you to make this process easier. So when should you typically share your data? Or when do you share your data? Do you share it once your findings have been published or do you already share your data earlier in the preparation process and maybe even before your paper has been accepted by a peer reviewed journal? So I think many people feel most comfortable to share their data once everything is published. And uh, they will then make their data freely accessible, get a DOI and allow others to find and reuse their data according to the licenses they've chosen. However, preparing your data earlier on and alongside a manuscript submission has also significant benefits. More and more journals require a data availability statement 
on how your data can be found and also be reused. And the data sharing has been suggested to lead to more citations, and it could also give you credibility to your scientific findings. I think we therefore always encourage researchers to start this preparation uh, early. eBrains offers three solutions for sharing your data alongside a manuscript with different levels of accessibility that will give you some peace of mind. So the first option is to make your data freely accessible after you've published a preprint of your work. This option is comparable to the previous option but gives you the advantage that you can now use the DOI in the manuscript submission. And this links the data directly to your paper and also ensures that your data is cited appropriately. The second option is to make your data discoverable but not accessible until your manuscript is published. Your data will be under embargo, uh, but you will receive a URL that allows others to find your data set. Once the embargo is lifted, you receive a DOI and this can be used for citations. The final option is to hide your data and your metadata until all your work is published and you receive, or you may receive a private and temporary URL for reviewers to access your data set. And this could facilitate the revision process. Once the manuscript is accepted and you release your data, you will also receive a DOI for your um, data. And all these options will allow you to get appropriate credit. Over recent years, there has also been a drive to publish another type of scientific paper that is better known as a data descriptor paper, in which scientifically valuable data sets are described in more detail. These type of papers advance the sharing and the reuse of scientific data, and eBrains is the recommended repository of nature scientific data, and later on this talk I will come back to these data descriptors as well. So let's have another poll. So what do you think is the most important reason to share your data or what, what is the most important reason for you? I've listed a, a couple of benefits and there's no right or wrong answer and you can only choose one, but I'm just curious to see what you guys are thinking. So again, it will open now. Please start the vote. Again, I'll give it a bit of time to see how many people can vote. Seems to be between two options. Oh, another one. Okay. Um, maybe 10 more seconds to give the last few people the chance to vote. Some people might be changing their, <laughs> changing their choices. I think this is very, very interesting because I think reuse and reproducibility are definitely very important for this, uh, for sharing data and also new collaborations. But it seems that a lot of you are very selfless <laughs> in this respect because a lot of, <laughs> advantages that you can have from sharing your data are also for you and not just for others. It will actually help you to acquire perhaps new funding and uh, citation again as well. Okay, let's move on. So where do you start when you want to share data? If you want to share data through eBrains, you will first have to fill out a curation request. And this is a short survey in which we ask you to tell us a bit more about your research uh, that you would like to share. And of course, if there's any questions, you can always reach out to the creation support team. Based on your answers, we identify the best process and the best curator for your data, because all our curators have a neuroscience background and some are more specialized in human research and otherwise others are more specialized in rodent research. Uh, once your creation request is reviewed and accepted, you will be notified 
and we can start the creation process um, earlier. So I'm not entirely sure how many of you are familiar with data curation and data integration, but the main objective of curating and integrating data is to combine data from different sources into a single location and also unify data as much as possible to facilitate a comparison between different types of data, but also different studies. So the creation process itself consists of a few steps, including the ethical compliance survey, data and metadata organization, filling in a data descriptor, choosing your license and uploading data for long-term storage. So let's just run through a few of these steps. So the first step is to fill in an ethics compliance survey, which we use to ensure that any study internal or external to the Human Brain Project complies with EU's ethical guidelines, independent of their relationship to the EU. So this is really important. So before I go into the next steps, I'm also curious to know whether or not you've heard about the fair data principles, maybe even earlier this week. So let's have a vote on that one. Okay. Well, this is good because I prepared a few slides for this. <laughs> oh. So I think the majority has voted that they haven't heard of the scientific or the FAIR data principles before. So the FAIR guiding principles for scientific data and stewardship were published in 2016 in scientific data. And the authors intended to provide guidelines to improve the findability, accessibility, interoperability, and the reuse of research. And many of these principles also emphasize the use of computational resources in this endeavor. So how do we actually make data fair? So data can become more findable by assigning persistent identifiers, such as a DOI, um, and also include descriptive and standardized metadata. The accessibility could be increased by outlining what is shared and also how you can access this data. And data becomes more interoperable when open file formats are used and the terms and keywords are controlled and also standardized. <clears throat> and the reuse of data can be facilitated by accompanying your data with a license to define the terms and conditions and also to standardize protocols again. So data organization is actually key to making your data as fair as possible. And it's therefore also important to start this process as early as possible. So data organization relies on five key principles. The first one is appropriate use of naming conventions. And this is crucial to avoid ambiguity and to make automated processes possible. It's also important to provide extensive human readable and machine readable documentation. You should be grouping your data based on common characteristics such as a technique, a modality or a subject. And you can indicate the relationship between data files by using the right older hierarchy uh, that is also understandable to others. And you can increase the accessibility of your data by using again like open file formats and reduce the number of different file types within a data set. So the importance of data organization has also been highlighted by the development of BIDS. And BIDS stands for Brain Imaging Data Structure. And this is a standard for data organization. And this is a great example of how to organize neuroimaging data. But I would also like to emphasize that data organization is crucial for all data types and not just neuroimaging data. And most importantly, of course, eBrains accepts the BITS data organization standard. So I would like to ask you, what do you think is more important, um, machine readable or human readable metadata? So I'll open the poll again. And again, there's no right or wrong answer. Um, I'm just trying to figure out what people are thinking. Yeah. 
it's great to see that so many of you are participating in the polls. <laughs> Wow, that's a <laughs> that's a 50-50. <clears throat> I think this is actually not that surprising because machine readable and human readable uh, metadata might actually be equally important. And I think you should actually include both at all times. So let's look at these two forms in a bit more detail. Uh, machine readable metadata typically relies on controlled and standardized terms that are also stored as key value pairs. So in this particular example, the key is the age of the animal and the value is eight weeks. Human readable metadata, on the other hand, typically describes the process of how data is collected and analyzed, but also how the data is structured, as you can see in this example. Uh, metadata is the foundation of the eBrain's knowledge graph. And over the years, the network of interconnected nodes has expanded a lot, and the number of data sets in the knowledge graph has grown like, significantly. And by interlinking data based on these metadata descriptions, researchers can find data sets of interest in the knowledge graph, and I'll be showing this in the second part of my talk. Uh, metadata can be any type of information, but it typically falls within one of the following three categories. So there's physical metadata, which describes the location of data and how it can be found. So this could be a digital object identifier or a DOI for online material, uh, or it could be even like a shelf number in a library for library books. And then we have logical metadata. And this provides details regarding the data governance or provenance of the um, data set. And they describe the process of how data was generated, starting with a subject and finishing with a data file. And this also includes all the methods and techniques that have been applied to the subject to create the data. And lastly, there is conceptual metadata, which provides a context to the data. So, for example, how were the data validated and which software is required to open and use the data. So in eBrains, we use metadata standards to curate data. And these standards are intended to establish a common uh, meaning and semantics for data sets and to ensure the correct use and interpretation of the data by its owners, but also by other users. Uh, the neuroscience field covers quite a wide variety of research that generates various types of research products, such as experimental data, simulated data, computational models, and sometimes even software. And although most of these use similar terms and concepts, it can be challenging to standardize these terms without losing study-specific aspects of the research product. Okay. So Open Minds was developed for this specific purpose. It captures common attributes of neuroscientific research, and it makes comparison between studies possible. Open Minds also includes a module for the standardization of neuroanatomical locations in neuroscience data, and this can be used to integrate them in brain atlases. So let's talk a little bit more about the data descriptor. eBrains requires data providers to always fill out a data descriptor that accompanies the data set. And this could perhaps feel as additional work, but I would like to emphasize that the writing of a data descriptor can also have important advantages. First of all, you could publish your data descriptor in journals such as Nature Scientific Data or Frontiers Data Reports, but it also reduces misunderstandings of data specifications and encourages the standardization of protocols in-house and also between groups. So some of the elements in a data descriptor are similar to standard research papers, such as the, the title, the abstract, a background, methods, and also references, but some of them are a little bit different. And it's important to, to know that the data descriptor should only focus on the the relevant data that is shared, so not all the 
other types of data. So the sections that are not as self-explanatory uh, are the technical validation, users nodes, uh, spatial anchoring, data records, and the code availability. And I will talk a little bit more in, uh, about these in the next few slides. So the technical validation section is a section where we ask researchers to provide any procedures that were done to validate your, your data. So you could think of control experience, experiments that you've done or refer to standardized protocols or even previous studies. And this section should answer questions such as why should I even trust these data and what did the authors do to test the validity of their results. The users notes are specifically aimed at the use and reuse of a data set. And with this information, other researchers should be able to open and view your data files. So this section should definitely include the version of software and also um, other requirements. And in particular for software, uh, software changes frequently and certain features may be deprecated in newer versions and that would limit your research reuse potential. So neuroscience data set typically focus on one or more brain areas and therefore, it's important to also provide an accurate description of the anatomical location that the work is related to. We use this inf information to spatially anchor your data set in one of the eBrain atlases. And linking your data sets has the advantage that studies that are targeting the same brain area are also linked and can be directly compared to each other. And this section can be filled out in various ways. You could provide a reference atlas so uh, in, as you can see in the first example, with specific coordinates, or you can use images and annotations. So the degree uh, of how you fill this in can be as simple and as complicated as you want. Uh, the code availability section is used for software and analysis packages that you use to generate and process your data. And where possible, it would also be good to share any links and references to where these can be found and whether or not they were openly available or not. Uh, if you develop any custom-made scripts to analyze your data, we encourage you to share these concepts, or these uh, codes and scripts as part of your data set. Okay, so as I already briefly mentioned before, the human readable metadata documentation is an important section of the data descriptor and in particular the data records section. This section shows how the data is organized and which naming convention was used and which older hierarchy um, you relied on. And a clear data records section increases the reuse potential of your data set as well. So to accompany your data set, you will also be asked to choose one of the Creative Commons licenses which define the terms and conditions for reuse. And again, you can choose to make your data as openly or as close as possible. And lastly, you will also be asked to upload your data for long-term storage. And we made this process very easy with our data proxies upload setup. So it doesn't require much effort. So before I go into the second part of the session, I think this is a good time to let some people ask questions if there aren't any. Um, uh, if there are any, uh, you can either put them in the chat or you can speak up. The mic is on the laptop, so not the... In the hand? Yeah. yeah. Okay, yeah. Well, no, no. Okay. Where is it? No, they need to move it. They need to move it. Oh, okay. Sorry. <laughs> is, is that a question? <laughs> okay. Uh, no, 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 no. Uh, yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks, thanks for this uh, great talk. Yeah, so I'm wondering, um, I think one practical issue that people face when they want to share data is that there is so many places where you can share data. Yeah. So, for example, for fMRI data, there is uh, NeuroWolf, NeuroSynth, OpenFMRI. So basically, there are these like specialized um, databases where you can share your data and get something out of it. 
So what, did, what, what were your argument, like why um, ZBrain is a better place to share your data than uh, other uh, platforms? Okay, I think that's a great question um, because I think it is true that there's a lot of uh, repositories out there that can be used to share your data. Um, I think the great advantage of eBrains is actually that it's, it's not specific to one modality of neuroscience. And I think the great part of that is that you can make, it can make comparison possible between studies of different modalities. And we also are uh, taking, taking in neuroimaging data or any of the other data types that you could perhaps like think of. Uh, there's team members who are well equipped to, to organize this in the most appropriate manner. So there's actually no particular reason to not share with eBrains. And I think the, the main advantage is that we make your data as fair as possible. And we integrate it with standardized uh, metadata. So the open minds that I already talked about, which does help you to, to make your data accessible for the long term. And it's not just a platform or a repository where you dump your data and never, um, that it will not be accessible in 10 years time. Mm -hmm. I think that's, that's the main advantage. Thank you, that's convincing. <laughs> Good. Um, are there any other questions? Yes, hi. Um, yes. So I have two questions. Um, okay. This looks great for data curation, but there are many shared collaborations that uh, recently like, have been going on in science. You want to share your data before it's published and done uh, with peers as you work on it. And I'm not sure how eBrains can support data that's not like post uh, experiment. They just want to curate and lock and share it with the community, but like online sharing as the project goes. So that's one question. And the second question is the standardized metadata. So if you have um, both neural data and behavioral data from tasks, like I'm not so sure how does it, the standardized metadata works for non-neural data, that ex like accessory data of the experimental data basically that is not neural. I track it, neural data. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, so let me go to your first question. Oh man. I already forgot half of it. Um, so let me go to your first uh, question first. So the sharing, sharing your data while you go ahead, uh, I'm not entirely sure if you want to share this with anyone or just collaborators. Uh, in in eBrains, we do have the possibility to make your own sort of a data container uh, in a similar way as the, the data proxy that I showed. And this could be accessible to a number of people. So it doesn't have to be just your, your uh, lab or your group. It could be multiple groups. And this way you can, you can work on the data together, have a safe place to store it. And then once you're ready to uh, publish your data set and to actually give it the appropriate DOI and uh, curation, et cetera, you can then lock your container and we can store it in the long-term facility. So that would be hopefully one answer to your question. Um, in terms of metadata and how this, how you could um, standardize different types of data, I can go quickly <laughs> to a couple of other slides. So we have uh, like there's a simple model for, for open minds, for example, where you have a data set uh, with a number of subjects that are linked to a particular protocol that is associated with a different uh, with a particular technique. And once they've undergone that process, that leads to a couple of files that are stored in a file repository. And these are obviously linked to a number of authors and have been given a DOI. So how we would link different studies is you could link them through techniques. Uh, so then they are linked through that. Uh, you mentioned eye tracking and perhaps something else. So they would have different techniques, but they could be linked through their subject or they could be linked through uh, an atlas uh, reference space. 
So for example, for the spatial anchoring, you can have your data set and you can link a data set to a reference space. For example, the human brain atlas or the mouse brain or the rodent, or the rat uh, atlas. And then you can use a particular brain area or a particular uh, coordinate system. And I think this is one way where you can link, link data. So it, it's not that we're converting your uh, eye tracking data into another format. It's just about linking them together in a way that you can find them and you can exploit them in a way to answer your question. Yes, thank you. Does that make sense? I hope it did. Thank you. Okay. Are there any other um, questions? <clears throat> Not right now, am I? Okay, that's fine. <laughs> then I will continue with how to access research, research through eBrains. So I've already shown you a video of the metadata that is stored in the knowledge graph, but I can also show, show you the interface that allows you to find the uh, research data. So that's the eBrains knowledge graph. To define a data set of your interest, you could use a free text search with keywords, uh, or you can refine your search by choosing whether or not you want to look at a data set, a model, software, or even a contributor. Or you can use the filter option and narrow down your search by choosing, for example, a species or a technique or a modality that you're interested in. Once you've found uh, an data set, you will be able to, uh, or you will be referred to a data set card that looks something like this one. And again, you can see the title, but you can also see the list of authors. Uh, it has a persistent identifier, a DOI, and a license. And if this um, data set is part of a bigger project, then it will also show up here. And this is where you could also combine different research products. So you can combine a research uh, model or a computational model with software, with a data type, a data set, uh, et cetera. So in this particular case, the data set is linked to the uh, Ellen Mouse Brain Atlas and is anchored to the CA1 region of the brain. And this can be viewed with the Atlas viewer. And I guess you can check this out yourself, uh, but I can also show you what that would look like. So in this uh, view, you, you see that the data set is linked to the CA1 field of the hippocampus. And in the atlas, all the data sets that are linked to this region can be found under regional features. So this uh, brain area has a number of different data sets that are related. So this is a way of linking your data set with other um, data sets. In the next uh, session this morning, you will hear more about the interactive Atlas viewer, so I will not go into too much detail. Um, there's also a list of uh, modalities, methods, and keywords that were used, and that can be chosen in this filter function when you're searching for, for a particular data set. And all the text that you see on the data set card can also be searched in the free search um, text area. So the data on, of this data set can be downloaded in two different ways. You can either use the direct download button at the top, and this allows you to download the full data set as a zip, as a zip folder, or you can go to the file list below at the bottom of the dataset card, and you can just pick a single file or folder to download. And of course, there's a, more details on this dataset in the data descriptor. Okay, so some of the datasets in the eBrains knowledge graph have undergone some, some in-depth curation and are also integrated with a number of tools and workflows. So this dataset is an example of uh, one of those data sets. It is linked to an analytical workflow to, for slow wave analysis. 
And this facilitates the reuse of this data set and also enables researchers to analyze uh, and model brain activity of a couple of those data sets. And again, since many of you are not on the computer, I'll also show you what that looks like if you go to this, this web page. So this is an analysis pipeline that is uh, set up in the collaboratory of eBrains. And it's a use case of how you can combine different types of modalities in, the, in a particular analysis. I think this would be great for you to maybe go over in your, in your own time. Uh, and it has also some Jupyter notebook uh, scripts that you can use to execute the pipeline. And it's a very interesting uh, um, analysis workflow. And more of these will follow in the next few years. Okay. Um, so when you're searching for data, you might come across different types of data sets that are um, temporarily locked and might require some additional, additional authorization to access them. So you might come across a data set that is currently under embargo. So those are the ones that have chosen to not release their data yet, but to make their data set findable. Some are uh, undergoing some review related to the GDPR, and this is mostly related to human data sets. And again, also there's, there's authorized access for human data sets that are a bit more sensitive. And for these sensitive and pseudonymized human data sets, we developed a human data gateway, which gives you as a researcher of a human data set, an extra layer of security. And for these data sets, a user, a data user will have to be logged on with an eBrains account and uh, accept additional data use agreements first. So when you request access, you will receive an email and by clicking on the link in the email, you do accept to these terms and conditions and are eventually redirected to a page where you can download the data set. The access to a data set is time limited and is also logged, but you can request access for as many times as you want. Okay, um, so I think I'll just finish here for now and acknowledge the people who are involved in, in this kind of work. If you have more questions, you can always send us an email on creation support at ebrains.eu. Uh, or you can follow us on social media. And if there is questions, any more questions, I'm also happy to answer them now if something came to mind. <laughs>